Hello church family, we are excited to share with you uh, that our first gathered worship service will be on June 28th. It will be an outdoor service actually out here in our east parking lot. We are asking people to register for this service so that we can gauge how many people are coming. Uh, you can see more details about this service and ways to register in the weekly update email or you can follow uh, the information on our website. We hope you will join us as we worship on June 28th outdoor in the east parking lot. Olathe, I miss you, and I know we all miss each other. So we are inviting you to connect with other members of our church family and share a meal through a picnic for eight or nine. These are small groups that will gather together. Um, everyone will bring their own food and their own chairs. You'll meet outside and just enjoy being together. We are gonna have three dates this summer. Um, the first one is gonna be June 27th, and hopefully the weather will be a lot better than this. Um, we ask that you register online by June 18th for that first picnic. One of the big reasons we gather Sunday after Sunday in worship is because we believe that the local church is a place where anyone and everyone can be loved like family. Through the gospel of Jesus Christ, we believe that the enemy is forgiven, that the stranger is welcomed in, and that the lost are found. It is a joy to worship with you. We want to take a few moments just to give you some opportunities to connect and be a part of our church family. If you are new, we are so glad that you've joined us. Please take a moment to fill out the Connect card. We'd love to get to know you, share information about our church and ways you can be more connected to our church family. The second thing we want to share is an opportunity for you to share prayer requests with us. We count it a great honor to pray with and for you. So please fill out the prayer card. We would love to be joining you in prayer as we care for one another in this meaningful way of practicing being the family of God together. And lastly, we want to encourage you to give. Uh, because of your generosity, we are able to be a multiplying congregation across five campuses around our city, seeking the common good of all and the glory of Christ Jesus. Your generosity allows us to care for needs as they arise in our community and around our world. So we encourage you to give um, online. You can follow the information on our website to learn how to do that. You can also write a check and send it to our multi-site office. Well, we're going to continue in worship. Please feel free to check out more information on our website or in the weekly update email. But we're going to take a minute as we continue on to take a moment to text and greet those around you. This is an opportunity to bring those into your home who may not be able to be there proximately. So reach out to someone you haven't seen in a while. Let them know that you miss them as we continue in worship together. for him. We were playing hide and seek this morning before church and now I can't find him. On the count of three, will you help me call to Hamilton? One, two, three. Hamilton! I don't hear him. I wonder where he is. 
he's behind me? Oh, Hamilton, you're so silly. Hamilton, I am so glad you're here with us today, hiding in your basket. What did you bring for us today to help us teach the big God story? Oh, friends, do you know what this is? That's right, it's a phone. And what do you use a phone to do? Talk to people. That's right. You know, I love to talk to my dad, and I could call him up right now. And when I talk to him, he answers, and we would listen and talk to each other, right? I enjoy talking to my dad because he loves me so much. Whenever I call him, he wants to know how I'm doing. And another reason I like phone calls with my dad is because I like to listen to what he's saying. You know, he knows so much about things that I don't know, and he helps me learn and grow. Do you ever talk to someone on the phone that you love? When you do, when you're on the phone, what do you do? You talk and you listen, right? You know what, boys and girls, there is someone who loves us more than anyone in the whole wide world. He made us and he's always with us. Who do you think I'm talking about? God, that's right. You know, God tells us in his word that he wants us to talk to him. And when we pray, we're talking and listening to God. You know what else? We can talk to God anytime, anywhere. We don't even need to have a phone because he's always with us. God listens and hears everything we say. Every prayer we pray is a chance for us to grow closer to him. You know, Jesus prayed to God the Father in heaven all the time, and he listened to the things that God told him. And then Jesus taught us in his word how to pray to our heavenly Father. Hamilton and I have a book that we wanted to share with you today. Would you like to hear a story? Okay. This book is called Loved, and it's based on the Lord's Prayer. It's written by Sally Lloyd-Jones, the author of the Jesus Storybook Bible, and illustrated by Jago. Hello, Daddy. We want to know you and be close to you. Please show us how. Make everything in the world right again, and in our hearts, too. Do what is best, just like you do in heaven. And please do it down here, too. Please give us everything we need today. Forgive us for doing wrong, for hurting you. Forgive us just as we forgive other people when they hurt us. Rescue us. We need you. We don't want to keep running away and hiding from you. Keep us safe from our enemies. You're strong, God. You can do whatever you want. You are in charge now and forever and for always. We think you're great. Amen. Yes, we do. I love this book about praying the way Jesus taught. You know, we can talk to God anytime in prayer. God is powerful and we can trust him to do what is best for us. And every time we talk or pray to God, we grow closer to Him. So I wonder, what do you want to say to God today? And what do you think He wants to say to you? Well, I'm heading to church with Hamilton. I hope you can join us. I think Hamilton still wants to play hide and seek. So see if you can find him while you watch the service with your family. And maybe while you're watching, you can draw a picture or make a list of things you would like to talk to God about. Parents, don't forget about our note sheet and Kid Connects for kids to use during the service. 
and our family devotional to extend your family learning together after the service. We'll see you next time. Bye. Alone in my sorrow and dead in my sin. Lost without hope and no place to begin. You love made a way to let mercy come in. When death was arrested and my life began. Ash was redeemed, only beauty remains. My orphan heart was given a name. My morning grew quiet, my feet rose to dance. When death was arrested, my life began. Oh, your grace so free washes over me. You have made me new now. Life begins with you. Released from my chains, I'm a prisoner no more. My shame was a ransom he faithfully bore. He canceled my debt and he called me his friend. When death was arrested and my life began, oh, your grace so free. She's Laid on a criminal's cross Darkness rejoiced as though heaven had lost But then Jesus arose with our freedom in hand That's when death was arrested in my
Father's love for us How vast beyond all measure That He should give His only Son To make a wretch's treasure How great the pain of searing turns his face away as wounds which mar the chosen one bring many sons to glory behold the man upon the cross my sin upon his shoulder ashamed I hear my mocking voice call out among the scoffers it was my sin that held him there until he was a brought me life I know that it is finished for our call to worship this morning hear these words from Paul in Ephesians 3 verses 14 through 20 For this reason I bow my knees before the Father, from whom every family in heaven and on earth is named, that according to the riches of his glory he may grant you to be strengthened with power through his Spirit in your inner being, so that Christ may dwell in your hearts through faith, that you, being rooted and grounded in love, may have strength to comprehend with all the saints what is the breadth and length and height and depth, and to know the love of Christ that surpasses knowledge, that you may be filled with all the fullness of God. Now to him who is able to do far more abundantly than all that we can ask or think, according to the power that is at work within us, to him be glory in the church and in Christ Jesus throughout all generations, forever and ever. Amen. in anything no gifts no power no wisdom but I will boast in Jesus Christ his death and resurrection why should I gain from his reward But this I know with all my heart His wounds have paid my ransom Why should I gain from His reward? I cannot give an answer I know with all my heart His wounds have paid my ransom
Today's scripture is taken from Luke chapter 11, verses 1 through 13. Now Jesus was praying in a certain place, and when he finished, one of his disciples said to him, Lord, teach us to pray, as John taught his disciples. And he said to them, When you pray, say, Father, hallowed be your name, your kingdom come, give us each day our daily bread, and forgive us our sins, for we ourselves forgive everyone who is indebted to us and lead us not into temptation. And he said to them, Which of you who has a friend will go to him at midnight and say to him, Friend, lend me three loaves, for a friend of mine has arrived on a journey, and I have nothing to set before him. And he will answer from within, Do not bother me. The door is now shut, and my children are with me in bed. I cannot get up and give you anything. I tell you, though he will not get up and give him anything because he is his friend, Yet, because of his impudence, he will rise and give him whatever he needs. And I tell you, ask, and it will be given to you. Seek, and you will find. Knock, and it will be opened to you. For everyone who asks, receives. And the one who seeks, finds. And to the one who knocks, it will be opened. What father among you, if his son asks for a fish, will instead of a fish give him a serpent? Or if he asks for an egg, will give him a scorpion? If you then, who are evil, know how to give good gifts to your children, how much more will the Heavenly Father give the Holy Spirit to those who ask him? This is the word of the Lord. Thanks be to God. Kids, I've got a question for you. And I know, I know you're not all kids out there, but you either are a kid or you were a kid. So, same question. What is the most ridiculous thing you ever asked for from your parents. I mean, think about that for a second, because it's like, as a parent, I'm hearing, dad, can I, or dad, may I, or would you give me, or would you do that, like, all the time. It's one of the most amazing things about kids, isn't it? Amazing slash maddening sometimes how good kids are at asking. They ask and they ask. They have no hesitation, no fear, no doubt, no shame. They ask. And they believe, at least my kids do, that whatever they ask for is within the realm of possibility. In fact, uh, many years ago, David was two and a half at the time, we went to the zoo together as a family, and we're standing there in front of the tigers, okay, watching the tigers pace. And, you know, I think, okay, this is a a teachable moment, and so I ask David, who made the tigers? Do you know what he said? Dada. Me. I mean, that was like the greatest day of my life. My son thinks I can make the tigers. Now, he's 13, uh, okay, and so uh, his respect for me is a little bit different than it used to be. Uh, But like, that's sort of the idea. Like if kids have that sort of perception of their parents, of course they ask. And they ask, and they ask, and they ask. I mean, how many of you were on like the 400th Zoom call of the day last week, at some point, when in walks a child to ask? No hesitation, no fear, no shame, no doubt. They just ask. Kids, asking is one of the most amazing things I think about you. It's one of the things that frankly the grown-ups in your life need to learn from you. We have something to learn from you. In fact, that's what, that's what Jesus says in so many ways. In fact, Jesus says prayer is just a little bit like this. No, not like you know, God's an annoying parent. I'm the annoyed parent, right? Um, No, that God, our God, our Father, loves to be asked by his children. He loves it. He can't get enough of it. He wishes you would do more of it. He never, ever tires of it. Your Father loves to be asked. Listen, I know... I know how hard it is to pray. Personally, it's very difficult at times. And, and maybe, maybe you've taken some time over these past several weeks thinking, okay, I'm at home more, or maybe I'm, I'm stressed more, I'm anxious more, and like, I'm, you know, so help me, I'm gonna, I'm gonna pray more. And it's hard, isn't it? But here in this passage, I hope that if you take just one thing with you today, it's this, your father, loves to be asked. 
And here, right around this, this parable, Jesus gives us three essential truths for learning to pray. Because your father loves to be asked. So look at Luke 11 with me. Because the parable here is right in the middle of some of Jesus' most important teachings on prayer. And it begins, actually, with the request from his disciples. It comes out in verse, verse 1. They say, Lord, teach us to pray. We're all beginners here. I love that, right? Even the disciples are like, we don't know how to do this. Show us. And Jesus bookends his teaching on prayer before and after this parable. And we'll get to the parable in a second. But he bookends it by showing them and us the first essential truth. Where does Jesus begin? Well, it's familiar to many of us. It's the Lord's Prayer. Look at verse 2. And Jesus said to them, when you pray, say, Father. And then Jesus actually ends this section on, pay, on, on prayer in verse 11 through 13, kind of wrapping it up with the same, the same metaphor, right? The same comparison. He basically says, if earthly parents, like as flawed as we are, if they know how to give good gifts to their children, how much more does our heavenly father And so if we're going to learn to pray, it begins with this truth. You have a good father. You have a good father. When you pray, Jesus says, start by saying, Dad. You see, a meaningful prayer life begins with our perception of God. And yet, here's one of the challenges, right? So often our perceptions are off. And and many of that is because, you know, some of us had terrible parents. None of us, even the best parents, are uh, like we didn't have perfect parents. And so we have faulty perceptions of of God as a result. And so for some of us, you might think of God as a stingy parent. Like he's he's a miserly father, maybe even cruel. And so you're not going to get what you ask for, right? Or if you are, you have to ask just right. You know, you got to prove that you really need it. You got to ask enough times in the right ways. You got to say the magic words. You got to do it all just perfectly. It's not about the relationship. And it, that's, it's exhausting, right? I mean, if that's your perception, like no wonder you don't pray very much. Now, for others of us, we might think of God more like the overindulgent parent, almost like a genie who exists to give us what we want, right? Of, of course he should answer my prayers. Of course he should meet my needs. What else, is he, what else is he good for, right? But it's not about the relationship. It's about the stuff. And even that gets old after a while. Or we think of God like a deadbeat. He's just out of touch, out of reach, absent, distant, unresponsive. And so why even bother? But what Jesus shows us here first is that actually our God is a good father. A good father who knows you, who longs to know you more, who longs to to be known by you, to show his love to you, who knows what you need better than you know it, who, who longs to give you ultimate joy and actually has the power to do it. You have a good father. And that is who we pray to. Okay, so that's, that's kind of the first essential truth, right? Book ending this, this story. Because now, now we get to the parable, uh, and it's right after the Lord's Prayer. And so you get, you've got to picture the scene with me, okay? Imagine this happening to you. So, so like, picture yourself, you're, you're waking up in your bed, middle of the night, because someone is banging on your door. And, and so you bolt up out of bed in that, that incoherent panic. You know, you don't, even, you don't even know where you are, and yet somehow you're, you're holding a baseball bat already. You don't know how. Like, it's just in your hands, because, like, just in case. And, and now you hear your kids crying, and, like, you are you dead? Is, it, is this hell? Like, you don't. You're so confused. And then all of a sudden, you hear more banging. Okay, it's the, it's the front door. And so you, you rush to the window and you're, you're trying to look out, but it's, it's dark outside and like you don't know whether to be terrified or angry, but either way, somebody's going to die, right? And then wait a second. Oh, well, that, that's, my, that's my neighbor. And, and so like, okay, well, that, that changes things. So you, you rush to the door, it's your neighbor, but you open it and you're like, okay, what, what's wrong? What's the matter? Where, where's the ambulance? Is there a tornado? Is there a fire? Should I get in my basement? I mean, you're kind of in that panic mode. And then your neighbor says, nah, dude, just had a a friend show up late at night and we we ran out of snacks. Do you have any chips? 
you kind of do one of these a little bit, right? You're like, really? That's, that's what we're doing right now? Fine, here, take some chips, okay? And get off my property, will you? Like that's kind of the, the response you'd have. And listen to this, this is what's crazy. Jesus says, prayer is a little bit like that. It's wild, isn't it? In fact, this, I mean, it's such a crazy story, right? And even, even scholars don't completely agree on what exactly is happening here. But the, the interpretations, they center upon this word impudence in the, new, in the, in the ESV. Uh, other translations, the NIV has it shameless audacity. And, and what's hard is that that Greek word is only here used once uh, in the New Testament. Uh, and on top of that, so there's, there's difficulty in understanding exactly what the word means, but on top of that, uh, there's confusion on whether or not is Jesus referring to the man who's asking, that he's the rude one, or the one who's being asked and his, his response, his frustration with him. Like, like who, who is it that's, that's being rude? Because that's, that's part of it. They both are in many ways. This guy's being rude. It's the middle of the night. But in a hospitality culture, this is a real emergency. Like not having food to feed a guest is a big deal. And so both of them are being rude. And so what do we, what do we make of it? Well, one of the best scholars of the parables writes, listen to what he says. He says, if a, if a human, here's the point, if a human will obviously get up in the middle of the night to grant the request, even of a rude friend... Will not God much more answer your requests? So think about that. Jesus is saying, if that guy gets what he's asking for from that guy, what do you think is going to happen when you ask your loving father? Your father loves to be asked. I think that is really at the heart of this parable. He loves to be asked that you can do this to him. Like dead of night, you know, whatever level of emergency it feels like, even if you're just out of tortilla chips, like God wants to be asked. Verse 9 is, I think, where Jesus gives his own summary of the parable. Jesus says, I tell you, this is right after the parable, I tell you, ask and it will be given to you. Seek, and you will find. Knock, and it will be opened to you. For everyone who asks, receives, and the one who seeks, finds, and to the one who knocks, it will be opened. You have a good father, and he loves to be asked. But it still kind of begs the question, doesn't it? Well, how how do we ask him? Like, how do we do that? Well, I think, think back to the story here. I think there's a few little lessons that we can point to and how we can ask. I mean, if your father truly loves to be asked, then you can ask boldly. Ask boldly. I mean, this man, he's got no shame, right? No fear, no hesitation. He doesn't come and try to butter up his friend. Like, you know those people in your life that you have to, like, you, you have to ask just right. Like, you know who I'm talking about, right? You have to ask just right for them to respond to you in the way that you're hoping. Or you have to get the words right. Oh, dear honey, you know, pretty please with sugar on top kind of thing. Or, or maybe you revert to, like, what about Bob? Gimme, gimme, gimme. I need, I need, I need. But, like, none of that happens here. He just asks. And no, Jesus isn't saying that you should be a jerk when you pray, okay? He's not saying that. But I do think that what he is saying here is that your father would rather you be lousy at praying and still pray than to not pray at all. Don't don't miss that. That your father, he'd rather you be lousy at praying but still pray than to not pray at all. Paul Miller, in his great book on prayer, he writes, don't try to get the prayer right. Just tell God where you are and what's on your mind. That's what little children do. They come as they are, runny noses and all. It's what kids do. And our Father loves to be asked, so ask boldly. Also ask simply. Uh, like, you can, you can get to the point. It's okay. Like, when my kids want a snack, do you know what they ask for? ask for a snack, right? If, if they're afraid, they ask for a hug. Like sometimes I think we overthink it. We make prayer way more complicated than it needs to be. Because elsewhere even, like Jesus says, 
Like you don't get from God from, by rambling on, right? By, by getting the prayer right, so to speak, by using fancy words or, or pretending to be something you're not. Like you're overthinking it. The prayer here is, hey neighbor, I'm out of food. Can I have some? Richard Foster, in his book on, on prayer, I, I love the way he summarizes it. He says, simple prayer involves ordinary people bringing ordinary concerns to a loving and compassionate Father. There's no pretense in simple prayer. We do not pretend to be more holy, more pure, or more saintly than we actually are. We do not try to conceal our conflicting and contradictory motives to God or ourselves. And in this posture, we pour out our heart to the God who is greater than our heart and who knows all things. To be able to say, Father, I'm a mess. I blew it again. Or, or, God, I'm, I'm afraid. I don't know what to do next. Or, or Dad, I am lonely. I, I need. I'm sad. Friends, our Father loves to be asked, and so ask simply. And ask expectantly. Because the rude neighbor gets what he wants, right? Which is kind of crazy. Like, even from that guy. Like, that guy gets what he wants from, from that guy. And yet, how often, like, if I'm honest, do I approach prayer a little bit like calling customer service, right? It's the worst. Like, you're on hold for three days, and you're not even sure it's going to help. Like, you, you finally get through, and it's like, ah, this is worthless. I'm wasting my time, right? Like, we, we often approach prayer very similarly, but not with our good father. And listen, it's, it's true. I am a lousy dad at times. Certainly, like, I did not make the tigers, okay? And sometimes I feel like if my kids ask for candy or Legos one more time, I might snap, right? But when my kids ask for something they truly need, and a good father knows, right? Knows the difference between something you think you want and something you truly need. He knows. I think when that happens with my kids, like, I'd, I'd tear the world apart, I'd do anything in my power to give them what they truly need. There's no end to what I would do for them. And listen, church, you never have to convince God to do what's best for you. You never have to convince God to do what's best for you. He's a good father. He knows. Verse 11, this is where Jesus wraps this, this teaching up on prayer. He says, what father among you, if his son asks for a fish, will instead of a fish give him a serpent? Like, who would do that, right? Nobody. Or if he asks for an egg, will give him a scorpion? No. Like, you know, like, Jesus is, is, is like, you know that's not going to happen. And it, if you then, who are evil, okay, he knows we're not perfect parents, right? If you then, with all of your own problems, know how to give good gifts to your children, how much more will the Heavenly Father give the Holy Spirit to those who ask him? You have a good father, and he loves to be asked. So ask boldly, simply, and expectantly. And then here's, here's the last, last thing. Your father will give you what you need. He'll give you what you need. Now, this is where it gets complicated, right? Because it's like, well, I asked for that thing, and he didn't give it to me. And so obviously what Jesus is saying, he's not like giving us a blank check here that whatever we want, that like we can just rub the genie and, and the, the bottle and it all happen just like we want. No, no, it's what, it's what you truly need. And the question I have to ask myself regularly is, is, do I trust him enough to know what I need? Not just what I want or when I want it or what I think I want, but what I actually need. Again, David and Eden, I, I mean, they're good kids, but they ask all the time. It's what kids do. And I'm not, I'm not God, right? I'm not anything close to that. But when they ask for something, I might actually end up considering a dozen other things that they've never even thought about to try to satisfy whatever it is they're asking for. I mean, this is a dumb example, but if they ask for a bowl of cereal and I know that in 10 minutes we're going to have steak, I'm going to say no, right? Because something better is at store. And our Father, He knows all of the possibilities, all of the good things potentially in store for us. And He might say no or not now, or try this instead. But only because he believes the alternative is better. And what's the best gift any parent can give their child? 
Kids, if any of you say candy or toys, I mean, just please don't, okay? And you know that's not true. What's the best gift? I think it's presence, intimacy, relationship, right? That's what we long for more than anything else in the world. In fact, when our our kids were younger, especially, and it still happens occasionally now, but it happened a lot when they were young, that they would ask for something or that they would ask us a question, and it became really clear that they actually weren't interested in whatever it was they were asking for, right? What they were really asking was for our attention. Like, they just wanted to make sure that we were still watching, that we were still around, caring. They wanted our affection. They wanted our presence, our, our intimacy, which I think is the key to all of this, especially that unexpected thing Jesus says right at the end, right? Because it seems out of, out of the blue, doesn't it? He says, how much more will the Heavenly Father give the Holy Spirit to those who ask him? I mean, why is that in there? Well, I think it's this. God may not give you what you want or what you think you want or even, or even what you really think you need. And I won't, I won't trivialize that. I know there's often pain and, and heartache, tears, along with that. But what he promises here is that he will never withhold his presence. He will never turn his face from you. He will never withhold his love from you. That he wants to give you himself. Which in so many ways is the goal of prayer in the first place, isn't it? I mean, the goal of prayer is not to get more stuff from God. It's to get more of God. He's what we were created for. The goal of prayer is not to somehow bend God's will to mine, but it's to spend enough time with him where my, my will actually becomes shaped by his and I start to want the things that he wants. The goal of the prayer is not to give you what you think you want, but to give you what you were truly meant for. And so it's no wonder. I mean, if that's true, it's no wonder that he wants you to keep asking. That you can ask in the middle of the night, you can ask for ridiculous things at ridiculous times, right? Because it's you he's after. And you can ask over and over and over again. He never gets annoyed. He's not going to get tired of you. He's not going to roll his eyes or push you away. He'll take you as he comes. He wants you and as any good father would. So much so that he would send his only son to die for you to hang on a cross, to bear the weight of our sin, to make a way for us back to God, back to that place of intimacy where, where his spirit can actually dwell within us and that we can be united with Christ forever. Your father wants you and he loves it when you ask. So church, will you ask him? Let's do that now. Let's pray together. Father, give us yourself, for you are what we long for. And even as we ask and ask and ask for so many other things that, that burden us, true things in our hearts, our lives, help us ask boldly, simply, and expectantly. And to trust you, our good Father, to give us all that we need and more. It's in Jesus' name that we pray. Amen. Well, our God wants so badly to be with you that he even invites us to this meal together. We call it communion oftentimes, right? Because it's about communing with God. It's about that intimate place of presence that Jesus died and rose again, his body broken and his blood poured out for you and for me. If you'd like to participate in communion with us and have the elements available with you, this would be a great time for you to do so. Christ's body and blood for you. Whenever you're ready, take and eat. As we remember Christ's sacrifice on the cross by proclaiming his death and resurrection through the Lord's Supper, 
Let us also remember our need to endure in the way of forgiveness through the confession of our sins. Please pray with me. Eternal God, in whom we live and move and have our being, whose face is hidden from us by our sins, and whose mercy we forget in the blindness of our hearts, cleanse us from all our offenses and deliver us from proud thoughts and vain desires that with reverent and humble hearts we may draw near to you, confessing our faults, confiding in your grace, and finding in you our refuge and strength through Jesus Christ, your Son. Hear these words from the letter to the Hebrews as assurance that God graciously responds to our cries for forgiveness. Seeing that we have a great high priest that is passed into the heavens, Jesus, the Son of God, Let us come boldly unto the throne of grace that we may obtain mercy and find grace to help in time of need.
Hi church, my name is Ben. I'm one of the pastors here at the Olathe campus. One of the things that we try to frequently say here at Christ Community Church is that we desire to be a caring family of multiplying disciples, influencing our community and world for Jesus Christ. Now that mission doesn't stop in the time of a pandemic. In fact, church history shows that it is often in difficult times that the church can grow the most. And so, especially in this time, we want to equip you with ways that can help you intentionally connect with, uh, connect with your neighbors and help them connect with Jesus. So, uh, you know, especially today in, in our culture, it can be so easy to, uh, to be focused on, on your family, on your work, on your friends on the other side of town, on, on church, that you can actually, we can forget about the people that we live right next door to. And so I want to challenge us with the thought, how well do we actually know our physical neighbors? And here are two ideas, two practical ways to get to know your neighbors and seek to develop that awareness of them. The first is to simply grab a blank sheet of paper and draw a box and put the name of yourself and your family in that box. And then around that box, uh, draw boxes that indicate where your neighbors live, whether you live in a cul-de-sac, in an apartment building, or on a country block, draw, sketch out where you and your neighbors live, write their names in, and that can just help you get a sense of the people that you know and the people that you don't know. And then take that piece of paper and post it somewhere in your home where you will see it and be reminded of it. Now, the second idea that you can do uh, to maybe challenge yourself a little bit more is to take initiative and take that bold step of introducing yourself to the neighbors that you don't yet know. Maybe you're both coming and going at the same time or you see them out mowing their front lawn or getting the mail. Uh, walk over to them, introduce yourself to them, get to know them, uh, start that conversation and, uh, and see where it goes. So those are two ideas to help you connect with your neighbors and hopefully eventually get them connected with Jesus. If you're able to try any of those, let someone know how it goes. Talk to your community group about it, talk to someone on church staff, or talk to me. I'd love to hear how it goes. And hopefully those ideas will help you connect with, uh, connect with your neighbors and get them connected with Jesus. Well, as we hear that sermon and prepare to take it home to our daily lives, hear this benediction, this Good word for the road from 1 John. And this is the confidence that we have toward him, that if we ask anything according to his will, he hears us. And if we know that he hears us in whatever we ask, we know that we have the requests that we have asked of him. Go now in peace to love and serve the Lord. Oh, yeah. <laughs> I seriously thought you were just like hyping yourself up. I'm like, I mean, we're recording, so we're good to go whenever you're ready. <laughs> or would you like me to clap again? Nope, I don't Okay, <laughs> gosh, that's really, that's, nah, I just was waiting. That, I don't know, action? I don't know. Okay. Uh, <clears throat> now I've got to compose myself for a second. We have three dates throughout the summer, um, and I've lost my train of thoughts. <laughs> okay. <laughs> <laughs> you, you don't have to step back. I, I just feel like I do. <laughs> <laughs> Pretty much. Okay, try again. Go now in peace to love and serve the wor world. Dang it. <laughs> the very last, last word. word. <laughs> <laughs> okay. Not too loud. Hey, kids! <laughs> <clears throat> We love children. We love children in Christ community. <laughs> okay. Good. Perfect. Well then, y'all. The doxology? Oh, I totally forgot! Alright, I'll skip this week. <laughs> <laughs> you, you be you. Okay. <laughs> I don't know if you want that. We also want to be mindful to practice appropriate disting, distancing. <laughs> <laughs> Disting. Disting. <laughs> I don't know how to dist. A word that I've never said before. <laughs> we are so glad that that we have a script that I don't know. <laughs> <laughs>
Got it. Got it. <clears throat> this is it. This is it. Ready? Yep. <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. No, don't. I'm afraid to do anything with my mouth. <laughs> <laughs> Lake Olathe Park, at, and uh, let me know if you have any questions. Hope to see you there. <laughs> I knew it was bad too, but when you started laughing, I, told, I lost it. <laughs> for who are we influencing it for again? <laughs> like, I, I was like, I forgot the word Jesus. <laughs> I just want to be off the camera. <laughs> uh, that's good. That's, that, was that was perfect. That was perfect? Okay.